trainer here, um, and I also well, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself in a minute and what I do here. And um, yeah, so what we're going to talk about today is nutrition and how we can help ourselves improve our body composition, um, reduce body fat, um, solely sort of with nutrition. There are other elements, obviously, when it comes to body fat loss, not just nutrition. So a little bit just about me. I um, well, 14, 15 years ago now, I've done my a sport and exercise science degree. I've, ever since, I've been working in the health and fitness industry, mainly working with general population, improving health, improving function, with strength and conditioning, um, but a lot of it has come down to getting people to lose body fat. So I've got quite a bit of experience and sort of started out calorie counting with people, putting people on low fat diets and, you know, sort of dipped into a lot of areas when it comes to fat loss and sort of found my feet about ten, nine or ten years ago um, and really had success with what I'm going to talk to you today. Um, it all sort of stemmed from this biosignature, um, which is, any of you have heard of biosignature? Um, for those of you who haven't, it's the theory behind it is that we store fat and where we store fat is determined by our hormonal status. So if we're quite stressed people, um, we tend to store a lot of fat around the belly, and so on and so forth. It's, some of it's a bit vague with science, um, but it's, it's a good, it gives us a little bit extra to go with when we work with biosignature and uh, uh, fat loss. So when you say vague? As in, uh, not vague, some of it's very well supported in like, if you look in research and literature, yeah. some of it's um, based on the people who developed it and what they work with, their, how they work with their athletes, so they for example, uh, if you take a, a skin fold off the hamstring, studying um, sports nutrition and performance um, as a postgraduate diploma at Westminster University, so a lot of ongoing education. A bit about what I do here, one-to-one um, -one personal training or partner per, uh, personal training. Um, we run six or twelve week boot camp courses where we get people in, work with them with their nutrition, uh, join small group personal training sessions here and um, we have about eight groups running at the moment basically um, I like to try and mentor people and trying to get them to lose body fat they come back for reassessments um, uh, and you know, just trying to get them to lose as much fat as they want to um, and then work with biosignature and nutrition one-to-one uh, -one consultations just fo uh, focusing mainly on nutrition okay so today if you like what you hear and you want to sort of help yourself and um, uh, work with me and getting your body fat percentage down, um, getting yourself lean, getting yourself healthier, 20% of the consultations. Okay, starting what, what we're going to talk about today is what makes us fat. Um, the tools that I use and that can be used to assess body composition and then focusing on successful nutritional interventions. So why should we um, worry about um, body fat percentage? So you guys haven't necessarily got a huge issue by the looks of you, but us as a nation are the third fattest in the world, um, and it's only going to get worse, as it seems. Um, um, diabetes has skyrocketed in the past 15, 20 years. Um, so as a nation, we have to be careful um, and use interventions to try and bring down um, body fat. Obviously it has a lot of healthy implications. But what classifies us as being overweight or fat? If we use these assessment tools, so you've got every heard of body mass index. So body mass index, you take your weight and your height and you divide it. Um, that can be quite a good tool, uh, quite an easy tool, but as you can say, you've got a professional athlete or you have got an overweight guy and they could come out with the same score because of the muscle mass uh, uh, that this, this guy um, has. Obviously this guy, you can see, is probably overweight. The waist to hip ratio, you get a tape measure, you put it around the smallest part of your waist and around the largest part of your hips and then you divide it <coughs> and according to this measurement, for a female you need to be um, under 0.8 and for a male you need to be under 1. 
Then what we've got is body composition analysis, which, which I use here, which is the calipers, but there are other methods. I don't know if you guys have come up with scales you stand on and they tell you how fat, uh, your body fat percentage. Um, and then you've got the Dexter scales, which is probably the best, which is this here. It's the more accurate. It actually tells you how much muscle tissue and fat tissue you've got in each arm and each leg and so on. But it's actually hundreds of pounds to have it done if you can find one. So the biosignature software I use here, this is taken from one of my friends, um, it gives you 12 sites, as you can see along the, boss, along the top here. Um, and as you can see from this guy, his number one site was his umbilical, which is his belly. So that would be a, a stress hormone cortisol issue. So we'd look at lifestyle changes, could be causing stress, sleep issues, it could be nutritional issues, it could be training issues, it could be all sorts of um, aspects. So we work with, with him to try and get his um, uh, stress site down. But as you can see, everything has had come down in like nine months, I think, when I next saw him and measured him again. Um, but this one still remained the biggest one. You'll always have a worse site. Um, but it's what we've got to try and do. As you can see here, you've got your body fat percentage is 21 here. And then it dropped down to just under 60. So, and then it gives you your lean mass as well. It's lean mass went up. Okay. So, um, what should you be for health reasons or for performance reasons? Um, this is for health reasons, and it's a rough, it's, you know, the, uh, different textbooks, different papers will tell you different things. But this is pretty much what um, I work towards. But I always go by what people want to be. Someone may ask me, what should I be? I would say for a female, 15 to 20% every they seem to be happy with. Some people would like to be leaner. Um, for a male under 15, so aiming towards 10 is probably a good, suitable, um, healthy body fat percentage. So, and then this is sort of the sliding scale. So on here, acceptable for a female, um, it's sort of 25-ish percent. Uh, getting under 20 is it's a good fat percentage and I find that most people who come if they sort of are in the 20s and then get themselves down into the teens and they're pretty happy with that but if, if you're into sport and you want to optimize your performance in your sport or your recreation or whatever you decide to do then it's probably a good thing to look at what the other athletes do in your sport to try and optimize your performance because if you're a cyclist for example if you're carrying around I don't know, five kilos of body fat, then it's going to affect how fast you can cycle. I've got a good story of a friend actually who he spent thousands of pounds on this super bike, took about five grams off the weight of his bike, but he had a <laughs> size and said to him, well, why don't you focus more on actually losing your body fat then, um, rather than spending thousands of pounds on your bike? <laughs> so, um, but that's, you know, that, that's what, that, that's quite a common thing that I've well, I've come across several times with people. So, but yeah, so have a look at what sports you do. Look at what people, you know, what is recommended you, you need to be at and see if you can aim towards that. And that'll give you a good idea of where you need to go. Regarding health, obviously, without stating it, um, without stating the obvious, there are these health risks that come with um, being too much body fat. Um, don't know very common when people come to me and they need to lose body fat, they get, they're very tired most of the time, they have the afternoon dip with a lot of bloating, they get like, you know, after they've eaten dinner they get feel quite bloated, they have gut issues where, you know, they're not going to the toilet as often as they should be, um, can get colds quite often, um, and we measure blood pressure here and it tends to be a little high. Starting, what, what we're going to talk about today is what makes us fat? Um, the tools that I use and that can be used to assess body composition and then focusing on successful nutritional interventions. So why should we um, worry about um, body fat potential? So you guys <laughs> haven't necessarily got a huge issue by the looks of you, but us as a nation are the third fattest in the world. Um, and it's only going to get worse, as it seems. Um, as, um, diabetes has skyrocketed in the past 15, 20 years. Um, so as a nation, we have to be careful um, and use interventions to try and bring down um, 
body fat. Obviously, it has a lot of healthy implications. But what classifies us as being overweight or fat? If we use these assessment tools, so you've got, have you heard of body mass index? So body mass index, you take your weight and your height and you divide it. Um, that can be the low fat diet, which one comes out on top each time. Um, and a lot of them are pretty significant difference. Okay, so from those studies, those 13 studies, um, there is obviously an indication that low carb tends to win when compared to low fat. Then there's a big meta-analysis done, so they take a data from 87 studies and have a look at um, uh, comparing low carb diets with uh, low fat diets. And again, low carbohydrate comes out on top um, when it comes to improving your body composition um, and when it comes to um, maintaining your muscle tissue. Now, when, it, when you do go on fat loss diets, one of the most important things I find with what I try to um, encourage my clients and boot campers to do is to try and maintain the muscle tissue. Because obviously as you lose weight, one of your, your body will want to take the energy from the, the it wants to preserve its fat tissue because it's a way of survival. Um, so we try to encourage um, a bit of protein, you know, in, increase the amount of protein people have so they keep their muscle tissue. Um, and it can be quite a difficult to do, especially with ladies, you see men, men, men find it easier to make their muscle tissue. Uh, another study was taken uh, by this guy, Lehman, and he compared a protein diet without exercise, a protein diet with exercise, carbohydrate diet without exercise, and a carbohydrate diet with exercise. And as you can see, the best result comes from having uh, a low, lower carbohydrate diet um, and a higher protein diet. Um, yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. Really? Um, so why is this? Why does these? Why does low-carb diets tend to come out on on top? Well, obviously there's carbohydrate. When you have a high-carb diet, there's a lot of blood sugar um, spikes and drops, spikes and drops. Okay. So if you take a typical person's diet. They'll go cereal or special K for breakfast. So you have a blood sugar spike take it down in sandwich for lunch, it goes up again, and pasta for dinner, so they're keeping low fat, but they're keeping high carbohydrates, so there's more tendency to feel hungry like two or three hours after your meal, um, and possibly crave more sugar because of the blood sugar drop. When you eat a diet that's more rich in protein and fat, you have a steadier release of energy, so you have a steadier release of blood sugar, uh, which will keep you fuller for longer, Hence why people tend to eat less calories um, when it comes to protein and fat. You've also got this issue with insulin. Everyone knows what insulin is? Yeah? So, um, uh, just briefly, insulin basically will package your um, uh, food you eat. So your blood sugar will go up. Insulin, depending on how high your blood sugar goes up, depends on how much insulin you produce. Um, insulin will grab the excess uh, blood glucose or blood sugar and it will try and store it into your fat cells, your liver cells and your muscle cells. <coughs> now the more insulin you produce, hence the more carbohydrates you eat, um, the less you will activate this hormone here, which is called hormone sensitive lipase. Now this hormone is the key hormone when breaking fat down and putting it into the bloodstream for energy. So if you want to burn fat for energy, you need to get this hormone, switch it on. If you produce insulin, this switches off because basically you don't need the fat because you've got the blood glucose for the energy. Okay, does that make sense? Um, and then there is an element, um, of, well, quite a big element, that you do reduce inflammation because when uh, certain forms of carbohydrate can be quite inflammatory to the body. So what happens is that the body will sort of turn on itself and, and treat like gluten and stuff like that as a, um, a foreign a agent in the body and start to sort of uh, try and break it down itself because the body can't do it very well and then you get inflamed uh, guts, etc. So that's sort of, you know, three or four reasons why um, uh, higher protein diets tend to work better. 
So a little bit about um, insulin again. So has anybody heard the term insulin resistant? Yeah, right, so just go through it briefly. Insulin resistance happens. So remember what I said, blood sugar goes. So you sit at the desk all day and you're typing and stuff and then you keep eating the pasta and you keep eating except, uh, the bread and etc. So inflammation goes up and um, what happens is that these car parking spaces will become a bit clogged up and they don't communicate very well with insulin. So rather than insulin putting the uh, excess blood sugar into the uh, muscle and liver cells, it starts to put, it, the muscle and liver cells sort of reject insulin's demands and then they start to store it in fat because the fat cells never, um, they're, they're sort of endless, sort of an endless car park type thing. So, and that if you keep feeding this car excess carbohydrates what you need, then this cycle will continue. So you'll eat food, you'll make insulin, insulin will try to put it in the muscle and liver cells, they'll say, no, we've got too much, we're sort of clogged up. So then it stores it as fat, then you feel tired and hungry, then you eat food and you sort of have that cycle. And some people say that, well, it is, this is sort of the precursor to diabetes um, in the long term. Term thing. So this is, and these are the sort of reasons, these are the sort of symptoms that can occur with insulin resistance. So it's quite another important reason why um, lower carbohydrate dots, if you want to lose body fat, tend to work better. And it's just, it's not that, you know, carbs are evil, as we say here, it just is that we probably, when we put on body fat, we're eating too much of it. So we're not active enough to use the carbohydrates. Um, so there's a, you know, we've been told, like in my early days of personal training, I was a big fan of high carb, low fat, etc. And it wasn't until the biasing to stuff and it sort of made me realise actually, you know, when you do look at it from a sort of scientific point of view, then you can see that when you do manage your carbs better and manage insulin better, hello, Hi there, sorry, mate. Um, you will burn fat better and you'll be less inflamed and you'll have more energy and stuff. But there is uh, an element that when you do get down to your body fat percentage that you want to, and you're happy with it, then you start to, and performance is a key thing, obviously having muscle glycogen will improve your performance, especially if you're doing sort of higher intensity stuff. Now, if you have somebody who's on a low carbohydrate diet, and they've done it with footballers, they put uh, set of players on a low carb diet, they put a set of players on a sort of higher carbohydrate diet, and the higher carbohydrate diets, people cover more ground, make more passes, etc. etc. Now, obviously, therefore, those guys need the carbohydrates. But if you need to lose body fat, you're going to have to sort of think, right, what's the most important thing for me at the moment? Oh, I need to lose body fat, so let's do the low carb thing maintain performance and then when we've got our carb when we've got up to our body fat percentage then we start to recycle carbohydrates into the diet and see how the body fat see how the body fat changes if it does if it doesn't then good you're good to go for a little bit more and a little bit more but it's always important to keep going back to monitor what you've um uh, how carbohydrates affect your body fat percentage does that make sense everybody right so moving on now on to how to optimize your body composition. How I pretty much work with most people. Now everybody is different, um, so one diet will not work. Everybody, there's always slight tweaks that you will um, uh, put into people's diet because people are just different. Um, you know, that's just the way it goes. But these two things, if we can achieve managing insulin better and reducing inflammation, then you're going to go a long way to improve your body composition. So the first thing to do in anything is always assess. So you get your starting point. Then you can see if it works or not. So you measure your body fat, whether you do the tape, the waist to hip ratio, the BM, the body mass index, you've got the scales with the um, uh, bioimpedance, or you have um, someone do your calculus for you. Just get measured, it's important. Um, do your blood pressure and your pulse and keep monitoring that, that's quite important. Um, obviously we want optimal blood pressure because that's that signifies uh, uh, issues with uh, circulation etc. Manage your blood glucose uh, and get that tested. Very cheap kit, we, I do it here now with um, uh, 
uh, personal training clients and some boot campers have had it done. How the blood glucose works is that you just prick your finger, puts it on this thing here and it gives you a reading. If it's above four, four and a half millimoles and you fasted, that's an indication that insulin hasn't taken enough blood glucose out of the system and into the cells. Does that make sense? So um, that's an indication that you may be heading towards a slightly bit of insulin resistance. Uh, something biochemically, there's biochemical pathways are just a bit hindered at the moment. So going on to that sort of low carb type thing, getting people exercising um, will go a long way to improve that. But you can, I mean, fit people. But the guy who told us about blood glucose, he said he measured about 20 personal trainers and about 15 of them all had higher blood glucose. So you don't necessarily need to be you know, obese or anything to have blood glucose. But again, it's quite an important thing. Obviously, we don't want to have diabetes or anything like that when we're getting older. So, um, and another test which um, can cost a lot of money, but can vary from like 50 pounds to 500 pounds or even more, is having food sensitivity testing. And the reason we do this is because there are certain foods out there that will inflame the body that we're not aware of. I don't know about you guys, but there, when I have eat certain foods, you notice you get bloated slightly with it. It doesn't have to be the typical wheat or anything like that. It can be, well, for example, I come up, when I had this done, I've had broccoli in mine and beef in mine and, um, uh, and what you, uh, and it just, causes inflammation in the body. So your body will have an immune reaction to it. Um, how they test for it is that you have a, either a blood prick again, or you have blood taken out if you have more, uh, if you're testing for more foods. This one is a 30 food test. Uh, and I, in the lab, they just take your blood and they um, put the enzymes of these foods with the um, blood. And then if they find that you produce um, immune uh, globulin A, which is called uh, then there's an immune reaction occurring with the enzymes in these foods. So as you see this person here, almond and cashews and garlic, they have a slight mild reaction to. So I would say to these guys, if you want to optimize your fat loss, just cut these out for a while, stick with everything else, um, and then you're just reducing the amount of inflammation and stress you're causing your body, okay? But the, like I say, you can have 30 food tests done, uh, sorry, test to test 30 foods, or you can have test to test 200 foods. Um, so, uh, yeah. So what we do is we eliminate all inflammatory foods. So grains, I definitely get out of people's diet because they tend, most people tend, well, nearly everybody does better when they don't eat grains, hence the bloating, etc. And they tend to have much better fat loss when they're off the grains. Um, from a paleo perspective, if you're looking into the research behind grains, people will always say that the gluten in the body will cause inflammation in the gut, etc. etc. Um, if you're eating grains and other inflammatory foods, you're going to more likely cause insulin resistance. Hello. Um, insulin resistance caused by the inflammation response. Um, and leptin is a hormone that signals whether you're hungry and you need to eat, and if that all gets confused, then um, that's not going to be great for your fat loss. Um, does everybody know what leptin is? Right, let me briefly explain it. Leptin is a hormone that was discovered in 88. It's, it's when you eat food, your fat cells will swell because you store energy into the foods. As soon as the fat cells swell, you produce leptin into the blood. The leptin goes up, the brain reads this and then tells the um, uh, tells your body to stop eating, so it slows down your appetite and it increases your metabolism so you start to burn energy. When you take a guy who's obese, their leptin signaling is all a bit skew in. So they, they reckon that it's the brain that cannot read the signal, so there's some sort of communication issue caused probably by inflammation. Now if your eating food, leptin's going up, but your brain can't read leptin's going up, it will continually tell you that you're still hungry and you're still eating. And that's why you get, that's why, you know, you say to somebody who's obese, stop eating, but actually, biochemically, their body is a bit messed up, so they're not doing it just because they want to, it's just that's the, the signals they're getting. Um, and once you're off grains and inflammatory foods, you tend to find people who have less bloating, 
Their gut will improve, they'll guess I'll go to the toilet a bit better, etc. etc. This here is um, a guy called Dr. Lalandi. He did an analysis of all the um, most important nutrients that we need from food. We make nutrients in our body, so we, uh, and we have essential nutrients that we need to get from foods. And he, um, some sort of calculation he did, did, he measured the most healthy foods we can add to our diet. So at the top, um, by far, um, is organ meats. So obviously liver, heart, etc. I'm not a massive fan of that, so what I do is tend to chop little tiny chunks of liver and put it in my bolognese sauce, just to give the richness. And I put it in my kids' food so they don't see it. Um, <laughs> Herbs and spices, but the thing obviously with herbs and spices, we don't have a big plate of tarragon and stuff sucking into it. It's in part of uh, what it says. Not only you don't really have nuts and seeds, um, but if you want to obviously want to lose body fat, they're quite high in calories. Like a bag of nuts, a normal size, smallish bag of nuts from Waitrose or Tesco's or wherever, will come in at about 700 calories, which is quite a lot, but they're very, very nutritious. Chocolate, so cacao, um, but Obviously, we don't need to have too much chocolate, but a little bit of dark chocolate, that would be fine. And then it comes down to fish and protein, vegetables if you're eating raw, a bit more protein, eggs and poultry. Um, and then down the bottom, as you can see, are grains, um, canned grains, even fruit. Um, probably more to do with uh, that they're uh, imported and they lose a lot of their, as soon as they're picked off the plants or wherever, they lose a lot of their nutrition value. So as you can see, at the top half, We've got a lot of protein um, up there, so it's quite a healthy, you get a lot of your essential uh, nutrients from um, protein, so um, it goes against that silly study that came out the other day, so we can go up and protein. So, what we're doing, we've um, been measured and we're eliminating inflammatory foods, okay, and we're optimising our nutrient intake, that is key, so we've got to get lots of nutrition in the body, okay, and once we've done that, Next thing we do, we look at the starches. So we get, we're going to try to improve your insulin sensitivity. So we're going to try to break that site into account, the size serving of the food. Good example is watermelon. It comes up as a very high GI food because the sugar's in it. They say, right, well, it's got uh, fruit sugar in it, so therefore it's going to increase your blood if you look at the glycemic index. However, if you actually look at how much sugar you're getting per serving, there's not a lot because it's mainly water. So when it doesn't actually have a huge effect on blood sugar. Um, so we want to get sort of lower GL foods into our diet. Now unlike this one, I wouldn't necessarily put gra the grain here or popcorn as a very nutritious food. Okay, so it would all be more of the vegetables like your broccoli and your green veggies and that sort of thing, which would be very low and very highly nutritious. <laughs> Okay, moving on, so we've um, been measured, we've optimised our nutrient intake, we've got rid of any inflammatory foods, and we're eating low starchy vegetables. Then we optimise how much protein we need, and it varies no matter what textbook you read, it will vary from 0.8 grams per kilo body weight to 2 grams. If you're doing a lot of weights training, um, which is pretty much recommended on a, on a fat loss diet, um, try and get up to about 2 kg, two, 2 grams per kilo body weight. But again, this is where the assessment comes in. You'll put somebody on, say, let's say eat uh, 150 grams of protein a day. They achieve that in a week. We re-measure them and we start, hold on a minute, you're losing a bit of muscle tissue here. Why are you losing muscle tissue? Maybe increase it a little bit and you know, keep playing around with the sort of numbers. Um, most people do fine if they hit about 1.5 to 2 grams with maintaining your muscle tissue. Your, your body will always break down muscle tissue and it always builds muscle tissue. And it's about getting the balance right, um, improving what's known as your protein balance. Okay. Um, other things, obviously go for organic free range grass fed. You reduce the amount of toxins and um, pesticides and whatever they put in the meat. And you're increasing the amount of omega 3s and the amount of nutrients that are actually in the food. Um, so a good thing to do if you need 150 grams of meat per day, work out how many meals you eat a day, and then just divide them into it. Probably one of the best, the best method I tend to use. Um, whey protein has been shown to 
be um, optimum if taken before workout. Okay, a lot of people take their protein after their workout, but like I said, as soon as you, when you're training and after training, it's, your body's breaking down muscle tissue. Um, your body will take about half an hour to digest whey protein. So if you take it before your workout, you're pretty much absorbing a lot of the amino acids into the muscle towards the end of the workout. So straight away, you're trying to get on top of that protein breakdown. If you take it after, you've got about a half an hour lag before you're into it. So, and there's been research done on that where they compare people taking protein before or after or no protein. Um, and, and the pre-workout tends to work uh, best. Obviously, if you're going for a long run or sprint, you might, you might see it. Again. So, with weight training, because you're, depending on what weight training you're doing, but um, you don't tend to get heart rate up massively unless you are watching training, high intensity weight training. Um, and obviously, protein is highly nutritious, and your body takes a lot more energy to break down protein than it would do a grain or a carbohydrate. So, we are eating protein, we've reduced the amount of uh, inflammatory foods, and we've, we're only eating uh, non low starchy vegetables. Then we're going on to fats. Now, um, unlike a lot of um, old science, um, people used to poo poo batter, uh, etc., etc., but um, what we want to do is to get natural fat into the diet. Just think na nature. Um, all this stuff here, I mean, this perfectly. <laughs> wraps it up nicely. You just want anything that's found in, in nature. So these here will be very high in your omega-6. Okay, so they reckon that your omega-3 to 6 ratio, which is your good fat, uh, bad fat ratio if you want to call it, should be about 1 to 1, okay, if you were to have it measured in, in the lab. Um, I've read in um, books um, that they reckon in America the average person is about a 1 to 10 ratio. So they have 10 times more omega-6. Omega-6 is an inflammatory fat. Um, omega-3 is an anti-inflammatory fat. So you want to get the ratio right. So if you're having a lot of vegetable oils, which if you have processed food and you're eating cakes and you're eating biscuits, you're eating crisps and you're eating you know, all the stuff that um, the USA and we are, living on, or you go to Greg's and have their pasties, or you go to, you know, where, you know, hate all that sort of stuff, you're going to increase your omega-6 ratio. That will cause inflammation, that can cause insulin resistance, that can will cut in fat, putting on fat, putting fat on the tummy, etc, etc. If you eat all the stuff that's rich in omega-3, then you're going to counterbalance that. So, look at this, even lard's in there and stuff like that. So all goes against what we sort of um, said. And it's, all, it's a slightly paleo perspective, it's all just going back to that's nature intended as type thing to eat. But again, when it comes to fat, you've just got to be careful with the calories you're eating. If you want to lose body fat, um, you don't want to have like, you know, loads of fat and nuts. So going away from nutrition just slightly, sleep is massive. It's, people nowadays, because we go to bed with our iPads or whatever, you're getting you know, five to seven hours sleep a night, where you want seven to nine hours sleep a night. Okay? Um, obviously, the obvious things is that it enhances memory, mental clarity, it'll improve your athletic performance. I don't know if I get people who are tired and coming for a workout and you just don't perform that well, as well as you will do if you have a good night's sleep. And obviously, you're in a better mood if you have a good night's sleep. Um, and when they have compared They've, taken, uh, they've done studies on sleeping habits and they find that fat loss is vastly better when people actually sleep sort of seven to nine hours a night. Um, so here's a study that's done. Um, sleep restriction for one week significantly reduces insulin sensitivity. Okay, so only in one week of actually sleeping five hours a night, their insulin, their ability to deal with carbohydrates significantly was reduced. Um, so, so it's affecting um, health. Um, so and one key thing when it comes to eating, I don't know about any of you guys, but if you don't get sleep, this ghrelin or ghrelin hormone um, increases. Now ghrelin is basically your hunger hormone. It will tell you you're hungry. So 
I don't know about you guys, but if I don't have a good night's sleep, um, so when obviously my kids were very young and you didn't have, you just want to eat all day. Um, and part of the reason is this ghrelin thing and your blood sugar is all a bit out of whack. So get some sleep, that's the key. Looking at exercise now. So, resistance training, when people, when studies have compared resistance training to cardio, resistance training tends to win hands down when it comes to fat loss, okay? Um, this training here has really been publicized in the last few years, high intensity interval training, um, and it does, you can do sprinting on it, you can do circuit training on it, all that sort of thing, and again, that's been shown to be really good for body fat loss. So getting, um, you know, running fast for, seven, uh, for four minutes, and then jogging for two minutes, or you know, doing four minutes of press up, if <laughs> you can do four minutes of press up, and then resting for two minutes and four minutes of squats, whatever you want to, but it's about getting your heart rate uh, right up there and working quite hard. Um, and a really good thing, and I'm going to show you a couple of bits, uh, papers in a minute, is fasted training. Um, training in a fasted state will optimize the amount of fat you use. Okay, because the more fasted you are, the less insulin you're producing, the less insulin, the more hormone sensitive lipase is going to be switched on. That enzyme that breaks fat down. <coughs> Let's have a look at interval training. So, compared to long steady state exercise, HIT has a good, if not better, adaption. So, I don't know if it's quite blurry this, but you've got your, um, basically this was the protocol. So you either have 50 minutes, this is, a bit blurry, of continuous exercise, that's your heart rate, or you have this three minutes on, three minutes off, three minutes on, three minutes off, hit training for 50 minutes. And I don't know about you guys, but and it has been um, studied, but hit training tends to be more enjoyable than jogging um, for most people. Um, if you look at the heart rate, um, the average heart rate percentage was 88%, 87%, so all very similar. Um, the average amount of oxygen consumption, 162, 166. Um, energy expenditure, 811 calories, 832, um, by 50 minutes. So, it's, whichever you do, it's pretty much going to be very similar things. And when they have compared hit training, even at a shorter duration of like 30 minutes, compared to 50 minutes of continuous, the adaptions of like um, upregulating certain enzymes to break down fat, improving insulin sensitivity, improving blood pressure, all seem to get as good, um, uh, seem to be as good in the, if you do high intensity compared to continu continuous uh, exercise. Um, so this is a study, so during my uh, postgrad diploma, this guy, Dr. Morton, did a study. So what he did, this is looking at um, fasted training. So he's, the book tells you, if you want to perform really well, you want to have 8 grams per kilogram body weight of carbs, then at breakfast you have 2 grams per kilogram uh, of carbs, then you train, and during your training you have a gram of carbs per minute of training, and then after you have 1.2 grams of carbs. He compared this, so he had a, several pe uh, a lot of people that did that, and then he, another group that basically had 3 grams of carbs, then they did a glycogen depleting training session. So they got their blood glucose, they used a lot of glucose, so they were on quite low glucose at the end of it. They had no breakfast, they had no sports drinks during their training session, and no recovery foods. One of the most important things here, they did this training again, this three minutes on, three minutes off. And one of the most important things to look at here is this. This is how much fat you use during your, your free fatty acid consumption, basically. So if you have a look, the red line is the blue line is the non-carbohydrate, or the fasted group. You can have a, they found that if you put a bit of protein in here, like egg or whatever, it tends to have the same result. As long as you obviously don't have something that's a protein and carbs. So as you can see, the, the uh, can, your body's ability, the body's breaking down more fat for energy here in the blue line, and if you have carbs. And a good example is um, when I used to work over at the home place, people would go in there, you know, wanting to lose fat, they're on the cross trainer for 40 minutes or whatever, but they got a bottle of glucose next, a bottle of leucosate with them. So all they're doing is burning that leucosate. What they should do is 
going through it in a faster state. Now these guys who were, some people, you know, some people would argue, well, you won't hit the intensity you need to. Um, but actually, the guy James Morton said that they did actually hit the intensity even though they didn't have the carbohydrate. Um, and here, this is the amount of um, glycogen they were using. So obviously a lot of glycogen, a lot of glycogen, a lot of glycogen. But the key thing here is that you're using a lot of fat if you um, train in a fasted state. So good, the key thing, so if you're wanting to lose body fat, is train before breakfast, or don't have breakfast, train and then have something a bit later on, and then you're more likely to use fat as your energy. Now, supplements. Now there's a lot of, um, uh, you, know, you go to GNC, you've got millions of supplements. Um, and supplements may help. Okay, that's all I can say, they may help. Um, if you've got somebody who followed a really poor diet and they are quite overweight and they haven't really exercised in five years or whatever, then trying to optimize the amount of magnesium they have in their diet by maybe throwing a few supplements their way like some magnesium, some zinc, some fish oil to try and reduce inflammation, that would probably help them. And if it doesn't help, their fat loss is going to make them improve their health. Yeah, because they're going to be more magnesium you've got, the better, the more insulin sensitive you'll be, etc. But specifically to fat loss, green tea's been researched quite a bit. And it does appear that green tea will, when consumed in quite a lot of, uh, uh, probably in a capsule form rather than drinking tea, will affect body fat loss. So obviously you've got here green tea, no training, lost a bit of weight. Um, placebo, no training, put on a bit of weight. Green tea and training, lost a lot of weight, etc. So, and they reckon that green tea will increase your resting metabolism, increases your muscle mass, um, and increases your performance. Um, probably to do with your drink, drinking green tea, they think the caffeine helps as well. Fish oil. So, fish oil will optimize your cortisol production. Um, cortisol is your stress hormone that should be high in the morning and low in the evening. If we work 14 hours a day and we're hitting deadlines, our cortisol level is going to be high all the time, so what we want to do is to try and get that curve back normal, um, and fish oil can really help with that. Also with regards to insulin sensitivity, your cell, cells, every cell is made of fat. If it's made with omega-6 fat, it's quite rigid. If it's made with omega-3 fat, it's more permeable and you can, the communication is better within the cell um, to the extracellular environments. Um, so it'll improve your insulin resistant, uh, yeah, it'll improve your insulin sensitivity, decrease inflammation, and it improves fat burning. So they reckon it turns on your fat burning gene, the more vitamin, uh, sorry, the more omega-3 you uh, have. Vitamin D, so obviously we live in the UK, they reckon anybody who lives above um, uh, Lisbon will be susceptible for low vitamin D status. You can get your vitamin D checked very cheaply by your GP. He probably won't, won't do it for free unless he thinks you've got, you need it. Um, otherwise, there's just put a vitamin D test and they send, uh, there's a place in Birmingham that will send you a kit and you just prick your finger, send it back and within two or three days they'll tell you your vitamin D status, which should be somewhere between here. Okay? Um, some people may say higher, some people may say lower. Um, ah, sorry, no, I won't say lower, sorry. Some people may say higher than that, but a guy called Chris Kessler who does a lot of research on vitamin D tends to say 50 to 90 tends to be the optimum. Obviously, you've got the risk of bone health. Uh, vitamin D is associated with, um, low vitamin D is obviously associated with poor bone health. But you've got other things that vitamin D now is being more researched into blood pressure, certain cancers, cardiovascular disease. Um, but it improves your insulin sensitivity, it suppresses fat storing enzymes, and it suppresses your hunger. Um, when you've been tested. So once we've done all of that, so you've gone all through all the things we've done, and maybe we've looked at um, adding supplements into the diet, you retest. And you go back to doing your biosignature, if that's what you do. You get your blood pressure measured, you do your blood glucose fasted, and maybe in a few months, not in seven days, you get your um, food sensitivity panel done again. And uh, obviously, we'll measure your body composition. And if things are going in the right direction, which should be about half a percent to a percent a week, 
you're on the right track. And you just keep testing, you keep doing what works, keep doing what works. If it starts to slow down and you still are eating what and following the same plan, then maybe we look, you look into changing your macronutrients or adding something. But pretty much if you do all those things, you should be very successful in, in, um, in fat loss. But, you know, when people have compared diets, there's a paper out about two weeks ago, which um, I haven't read yet, but I saw the, read the abstract briefly. They compared lots of diets, and it just tends to come a lot down to um, how well people adhere to the, to the diet, really. <laughs> and the low-carb um, diet tends to work better because people find it easier to sort of stick with um, as well. So obviously if you have a diet that somebody's not going to really stick with because it's too strict, uh, too, uh, then you're not going to get success. So you've got to make sure that people, that, you know, fits with them as well. So to summarise, um, and I'll shut up chatting and you can ask me some questions. Find your starting point. Eat very highly nutritious foods as much as possible. Um, just get to that, you know, organ meats, proteins, vegetables. Avoid any foods that will cause inflammation. Manage your macronutrients, so work out how much carbs you can tolerate, how much protein you need to maintain your muscle tissue, how much fats you need. Um, and get sleep. So this my fitness pal? My fitness pal is an app on the iPhone. But is it? <laughs> it's um. I find it useful when I'm testing out things or whatever on myself. Um, yes. But I also find it easy for clients to use because you get them to write a food diary. They don't. Um, <laughs> Or they say, the typical thing is you say, right, write a food diet for four days. They go, food. I didn't write it that day because I wasn't very good. That's the point. <laughs> I want to know when you're not very good. I don't want to know when you're really good. Because if you're really good and you're still overweight, then you're probably not really good. So we need to know why you're... So my fitness power is very easy. It's got a really good database. It recognises Waitrose and Tesco's and all that sort of stuff. So, um, And when it comes, if you're... Let's say on day one of starting, I, always, I don't get people to weigh out food or use my fitness pal. I get them just to do the things I ask. If people start struggling a little bit and fat loss is very slow, then we might dip into that and say, right, just for a week, look at how much you're eating, work to this calorie ratio, make sure you've got this amount of carbs and proteins, etc., in your diet, and just be a bit, what well, I would, you know, anal about it. And then, if they do all that, they tend to find, oh yeah, I didn't realise how much cake I was eating or whatever. It tends to come up there, up the, the obvious, um, when people write it down. And there is a good programme on it, well it's not a good programme, it's, it's all right, but it's on TV and it, it, it tracks people who say they are eating the perfect diet and they're not losing weight, and what they do, they set up cameras in their house without telling them. And actually they, <laughs> they end up going into the cover for things, and you sort of, for some reason the human body forgets about that, but remembers the good stuff. Train three to five times per week. Now, it's always nutrition and lifestyle is the key. <coughs> Exercise will help. You'll always lose body fat if you eat well and your lifestyle's very good, um, and you sleep well and you haven't got huge amounts of stress. But if you train really well, but your diet isn't up to scratch, you won't lose fat. So you can lose fat by not training, but you can't lose fat by not following a good diet. Introduce supplements wisely, so don't just take vitamin D, get it tested, take it, retest three months later, see where you are and then change your dosages. Don't just, I've done it in the past, and just, you know, buy 200 pounds worth of supplements and start throwing them down your throat, but, you know, some of them will be doing you good, so you wasting your money. Reassess and then repeat if it's good. Any questions? Not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So for the fasted state, yes. um, training, I mean, it's kind of because you said take, that it's good to take protein before. So yes. So obviously there's two different views on that. Yeah. But you know, BCAAs. Yes. Would you still consider it being. BCAAs, uh, no, the thing with BCAAs is that taking them, taking whey protein will raise insulin. Insulin doesn't just respond to carbohydrate, it responds to any type of food. If you take BCAAs, because it's quite a pure form of amino acid, 
it will spike blood sugar quite quickly. <coughs> adult blood sugar, it spike blood proteins quite quickly, so insulin will have to deal with that. And so, and going back to that hormone I was telling you about, if you've got high levels of insulin, that will switch off. So then you won't, you can probably less effective at burning fat. The thing with an egg, is that actually egg is not a protein, it's more of a fat. There's about 60% of fat in an egg, right? and then there's about, uh, let's say 40%, but it's not because there's a little bit of carbohydrate in it. But it's, it's, takes, it's just longer to digest, so there's less of an insulin spike. Um, but BCAAs take, bit, when it comes to BCAAs, whey protein tends to work when researched. I would go for whey protein first, because whey protein will have BCAAs within the product, um, uh, and then add BCAAs in uh, more so if you find you're not maintaining lean tissue. Does that make sense? So go for whey first, because yeah. whey tends to be the best okay. for maintaining tissue. But then if you find you're not maintaining tissue, then BCA. BCA is basically leucine, which is an amino acid which has been uh, shown to be the best for um, uh, muscle, putting on muscle or ma managing muscle tissue. Um, but whey protein has leucine in it. But if you just need that extra pump, then add in the BCAAs. But say, so if my sole goal is losing fat, yes. I should rather just, just do fast yeah, If you can train without food, then, then brilliant. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, don't, yeah, I mean, if you, like I said, in that, in that study, these people managed to train at a high intensity. And I get people who come, like, we have a 6.45 boot camp that Michelle comes to, and <laughs> we, um, most of them would be fasted. But then I have somebody who comes to the 7.30 who can't do it fasted, she just feels a bit gippy if she trains that hard. Mm -hmm. So it, again, it's individual where you train, and you'll hit your fat burn. When you say train, is it any type of exercise or do well, you eat weights exercise? Yeah, I actually The do. interval training yeah, is the best for fat loss. Right. If, if, you, if, it, if you're not a fan, I don't know, if you haven't got access to weights, mm. uh, I think as you get older, it's quite important, as well, even, I think it's quite important to do weight training anyway because muscle tissue mass strongly related to diseases and stuff like that you know if you have people with lower lean mass mm -hmm. tend to be more susceptible to certain mm -hmm. types of issues you know uh, whether it's uh, insulin resistant or being diabetic or something oh. like that so I would say always go resistance training some people aren't a fan of it then I would go, go outside and do some sprints sort of or, or some four minute runs at, at quite a, you know so at the end of the four minutes you are <laughs> hanging on to the lamppost and then two minutes to recover, and then go again type of thing. That's the best. If that's not your cup of tea, then fasted running, or walking, fast walking, or something. So again, it comes to clients, what favours the client um, the most. I can't, you know, if I've got a, I train a 79 year old guy, I wouldn't tell him to do sprints. <laughs> you know, it's no, but he wouldn't include Pilates or, no, or because Zumba, for example. Could, no, a Zumba maybe, because uh -huh. it's, oh, wait a minute. Zumba maybe, um, because I suppose if, I've never done I've never done it in my life, but I, I imagine it, if if you're at a fitness level where you're doing Zumba and your heart rate's getting, yeah, yeah. you know, and you're absolutely on your knees at the end of it, then brilliant. Oh, then Pilates. Yeah. I mean, I've done Pilates and sweat. That's resistance, though, Pilates, no? Yeah, but I don't think it's it's quite. A, it As depends on what you're doing. I'm getting Pilates. I mean. I know Pilates does intrinsic muscles, doesn't do global muscles. Yeah, but Pilates again, if you, if you do Pilates and like reformer stuff, yeah. I've done Pilates class with one of the instructors here and I've been sweating. Yeah. But because you. Uh, oh, it's the sweating It's the sweating It's the heart yeah, rate. Yeah, yeah. It's about your heart rate. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. If you work intrinsic muscles. The sweating muscles, is in Pilates. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's if you're. <laughs> that's oh, yeah, it. yeah, you yeah, need yeah, to be yeah. out of breath. You need that. And you get that from contracting like biceps and chest muscles yeah, and yeah, back muscles, yeah, you don't necessarily get it from doing core stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like another typical thing is, do sit up to lose belly fat, mm -hmm. it doesn't work, it's never been proven science and it doesn't work, unless you can do sit ups and get your heart rate up at 90% for 4 minutes then have a rest and do the same again, <laughs> that's the only way. It's all about the heart rate um, when compared. Okay. Any other questions? I know you said no grain, um, I, I have gluten free oats for, yes. for breakfast Yes. and I'll have that with fruit. I yes. Too much of that, but it just adds a little substance. Yes. And it fills you up a little bit. Yeah. So I mean, gluten-free oats because they don't have gluten in it. Yeah. Some it depends again what what your 
body is used to, for me, going to me, I am terrible with, I eat oats and I just blow it, so I won't eat oats. But if you're fine with oats and you're having gluten-free oats, then fine. If you want to lose body fat, I wouldn't necessarily have that and then train, because all you're going to do is burn into the oats and the berries or whatever you're having. Yeah, sure. And once you've exhausted that, then you'll go into your fat stores. So if you want to lose body fat, I would have that sort of later. Um, and again, it comes down to if you're having oats and you're having loads, loads of carbohydrates and you want to lose body fat, then you just need to keep the carbs on a whatever suits you, and that's where you measure body composition. So you measure body composition, say yes, keep the oats, let's see if we can lose body fat and have the oats for you, personally. And if you can, great. Yeah. And how long can you train without having to take some form of sustenance on board? As in, in, in increasing your glycogen, as in like carbohydrate or something, an hour. Uh, yeah, they say after an hour you've exhausted all your muscle glycogen. And if you want to sustain a level of performance, so for example, if you're running a half marathon and it takes you an hour and a half to do, it's probably recommended to take on glucose of about an hour or so, or maybe 45 minutes, to get it into the system to push you on. Okay. When you train, this last thing, the miles that going, the higher the intensity of the training, yeah. the more you rely on muscle glycogen. Yeah. So us standing here and chatting, we're burning fat. Or walking or doing your Pilates, you're burning fat. When you want to get it to a higher level, your body will try and use muscle glucose, blood glucose, muscle glycogen. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing your half marathon or whatever, and you keep an 80% heart rate max, if you don't load with glycogen, your performance will probably decline as you keep going. Okay. Um, to a certain level where you burn fat, 60%, yeah. and then you can maintain that forever because you've got loads of, you know, your body stores about 20, 20 times more energy in the fat cells than it does in the muscle cells. So, yeah. yeah. Any others? One or two more? I'm going to be outside if anybody wants to ask me a question. Um, so do come up and have a chat. And thank you for coming. <laughs>